Yes, we work at, uh, at Pennsylvania I.O. where we do things like this and uh, try to make that work. Um, Lucentech is a transitional architecture for linked data, so you can actually shoot and say, it's not really linked data at some point, and you'll be right. And what we aim with this is to get linked data used <coughs> in companies. When we look at linked data, we see that really, if, if you look at how a business solution, a software solution is chosen, it is different than what we choose so far. If you look at the data world, we do something different. See, the business solution is basically chosen when there's a low total cost of ownership. Yeah, that's not really the case with linked data. Um, we don't really have the benefits yet, and it has to be easy to adapt and extend. And linked data is really rich, you can really think about things long, so it's, it's not really changeable. Um, we want predictable performance, which is something that Sparkle endpoints don't really have. Um, needs to be easy to maintain, well that really holds, and there's a low initial cost, that's not necessarily the case either. So there's, there's definitely a gap here between linked data and what businesses really think about. They're way cheaper than what we look at. Um, businesses look at something else. Something that does have this is, is, um, is we don't have this. Something that does have this is, is microservices. Microservices are from a distance, you know, from a marketing perspective, they're awesome. See, they're, they're tiny, so you can understand anything of them, and they're very easy to debug because they're tiny amounts of code, and they're very easy to reuse. So this, this would be a perfect solution. This is something you can sell. Only, of course, in practice, there's a bit of an inverse there. Um, this sells easily, but it's hard to actually you know, get running. Um, in practice, we have data model dependencies. Two microservices that basically talk about the same data. They, they can't really necessarily communicate. See, uh, assume that I have a first name and a last name. I have the two of them in my database. I can basically choose to store them together or to store them separately. It's basically a random choice for many applications. If I choose to store them separately, then that means that I have more detailed information. If I store them in one field, I have less detailed information. Okay? The more important thing is, if two microservices assume a different model, one assumes that they're separated, and one assumes that they're the same in one field, <coughs> one in two fields, then they won't be able to communicate correctly because they have different assumptions. So microservices, people say, well, it's easy. Just you know, drop an API in between. So you can actually build an API in between and say, Look, this API basically understands the two of them. But now you have a different problem. Your API now has to be standardized. If you want to reuse that microservice three years on from now, and you have changed your API, that won't really work anymore. So basically now you've shifted your, your requirements from a data model to an API model, which at best is even worse. Um, lastly, there's disaster analysis. Microservices are terribly hard to do disaster analysis. Assume that I have a Facebook registration. Very simple thing. Um, the first thing that will happen is my microservice will go to some other microservice and first so my client says, hey, I want to register using Facebook and then I have this registration service and the registration service says, I'm gonna first check if you already exist, so it checks if you already exist in the database, you don't. Comes back, it then goes to this Facebook registration service and that one actually goes to yet another service. By now we're about here. Um, and that microservice basically has to figure out where the contents come, so what information Facebook has to share on you. Imagine that this thing fails in that whole path. It, it's not necessarily complex to say we can't contact <coughs> Facebook, but you somehow need to standardize on all of these error messages and get them back to the front end, which in microservice world is it just, it's not really the easiest thing to do. Um, we like easy, we don't like hard. This isn't easy, this isn't what they sold us with microservices. But we can actually do better. Assume that our microservice would have a direct connection <coughs> to a database, which in itself is a bit of a weird idea, but okay. Um, and assume that we would use a semantic model to talk to that database. Our initial problems are now gone. Our initial problems are, did we really know how to structure the data? Well, we really thought about that data. And that's really where linked data plays a role. It plays a role in a totally different field than how we choose business solutions. This, this, is, this has got nothing to do with microservice per se. But if we first think about that data model and standardize that data model in a way that we know that we'll be able to cooperate it with it with distinct entities, then we have something that can work. The linked data model works between two totally different entities and different continents <coughs> producing data which don't necessarily know each other, and in the end, the data integrates. I guess we can make that work for microservices within one company or across companies within a region. It's not the hardest to do. Um, you get some extra things from that. See, if you embrace that semantic model, you actually really know what you're talking about. You have documentation about the fields that you want to talk about. 
you get functional microservices. All the benefits from functional pro programming, very similar to that, you get that. Because if you basically have, if, if these are separated, then that means that you get a front-end call, and that asks you to do something. Please register me using Facebook. And that microservice has that responsibility. Now, it knows how to write it to the database, because we have standardized the way of doing that, like Fof, for instance. Um, we've used Fof from, from the beginning, and we initially thought it was complex, and in the end thought, we really need this, so it, it makes sense. And you get standardized APIs, and this is marketing bullshit standardized APIs. This is a standardized API that went through the whole W3 track in order to get standardized. So if you talk Sparkle to your database, you know that people have thought about what expressivity really needs to be in there. Um, this way of working makes it <coughs> extremely easy to both share microservices between applications, because you have the semantic model and that apparently works. It makes it very easy to debug them, because they're functional. So you can very easily check what happens. And the semantic model is something that people like us will probably be natural, but it's something that has to be learned. And it's just something we ignore so far. Um, we didn't necessarily, oh yeah, you get these na nice fancy pictures too. Um, if you want to explain what data is to non-data people and you show a graph, you can actually work with that graph. Um, on the left, for instance, so th these are your microservices that operate. On the left, you have a person and you can actually explain th that that person goes drinking, uses a bus, has a diploma, um, and some other person has called about a diploma. They went to a party together, had a boat trip at the party. You can make a whole story about this. And even though non-technical people might not necessarily care about linked data, the model in itself is expressive enough for them to understand the model. It was built in order for them to understand it. So you get something that you can actually explain and work with. Um, we didn't set out to be this awesome architecture that would do this and that would actually be productive. News will go in details, but the, the short history about it is that um, Erica and I essentially needed to share code, and we were really happy with Rails, except for the fact that Rails was made terribly complex. Um, so we realized that Rails probably wouldn't be the productive thing anymore. So we just started searching, like, in what way can we build something with the knowledge that we have that would be that would allow us to share code? And we just, we, we quickly noticed that you have to, if, if you don't know what you want to choose now, you basically have to stay alive. You have to pick something new. Um, you have to pick something that can change over time. So we knew that a bigger solution, one big framework, we wouldn't be at the right spot in the right time to choose the right framework. So we almost had to go microservices. And then we realized if we ever want to share data, the only way of doing it really is linked data. So the platform in itself basically arrived out of a necessity, say. Um, but it does work, and it, it works well. Niels? OK, so we built GUI and I'm going to try and explain it in 60 seconds. And I'm going into a bit more detail later on because 60 seconds is really short. What we went for is uh, user-facing microservice, which means that um, one request from your front end is handled by one microservice, one microservice exactly. And that microservice talks to um, a triple database where data is shared. Um, we use Docker to deploy our services and our front ends to make it easy to, to um, uh, they take care of everything, to download, to build, um, to deploy. And everything's integrated in a single page app, which is a JavaScript uh, framework that talks to our um, Mac and services. And we have very well-known requirements, which makes it easy to integrate all these things. We build on standard uh, standards, HTTP, JSON, SparkQL, and that makes this framework really work. So. A bit more than 60 seconds, I think, but um, as i already mentioned, we really focused on keeping it super simple. Um, we aren't all microservice experts. We aren't all uh, UI experts. And we just want something to get stuff done, to build the software we want. We don't want to build this super effective, complex system that no one understands. No, we want to have the freedom to experiment, to improve gradually. And that is what this framework is about. Uh, we focus <coughs> on orthogonal features so that it's easy to mix and match microservices as we need them. Um, and this greatly helps uh, reusability. Uh, by minimizing requirements, our services are very easy to understand and talk about. By focusing on this simple metal, mental model, 
um, it's, it's very easy to work on. <coughs> so what is this mental model? Well, um, for starters, we limit the base technologies that each microservice is built on. We focused on JSON API, which is a very well written out standard of how you can build a CRUD REST API. Um, this, these services talk through HTTP with the front end, so JSON API, and um, use SparkQL to uh, query and store data in a triple database. This uh, provides both restrictions and freedom. Um, because we focus on these f few um, technologies, it's also very easy to reason about, and it's very easy to mix and match things. It's, it's truly, truly fantastic, fantastically quick to write things. Um, because you have these constraints, you know you're going to be talking JSON API, you know that this is very easy to use in your front end because you keep using these same APIs. And then there's the semantic models in the back end. Um, as I mentioned, we use SparkQL, but the awesome thing about these semantic models is linked data. And linked data always sounds awesome, like you can link things and you can find things, but what it's really about is that you can also just focus on the part that you understand. So take your user registration, for example. We have a service that registers new users, and that's all it has to understand, users and accounts. Another service, a login service, can link to those accounts and can link the current user session to the account. If we look at the triple store, it looks a bit like this. So at the top, you have the triples mentioning that we have a user called Art Vestaden, lovely Art, mention yourself. Um, he has an account and a password, and that's all the registration service cares about. The login server has a bit more information. Here we see the session linking to that account, and it will, of course, also validate the password and the username. And that's the awesome thing about the semantic model. You can focus on the parts you are interested in and still have um, comprehensibility for bigger services, for linking services. A huge advantage of using FOV in this uh, example, but using linked data in general, is the ontologies that already exist, they are well thought out, and we found that, um, for example, for FOV, um, they're made this good, that we can reuse them even for different services. We can use the FOV model to do just regular username password logins, but also to support all OAuth logins or other providers like ACM IDM, which is a provider from the Flemish government. So we can have many implementations, but still keep the same model. Then I already mentioned Docker. Um, so I don't know, show of hands, who's familiar with Docker? Okay, so about half the room, so I'll quickly explain. Docker um, is actually two things. Uh, on the one hand, you have um, the Docker container, which you can just run locally, and it, you can compare it to a lightweight virtual machine, a bit like a shroud. It's still sharing the kernel of the host. Um, it's a lot lighter than an actual virtual machine. And then Docker Compose, which uh, allows you to combine these uh, different Docker images into a platform. And it's uh, very easy to set up to um, I think I have a small example later on to so have small descriptions of your platform. You can just run a command, it downloads the necessary um, containers and boots them up. Um, so yeah, hosting of these containers provided by uh, hub.docker.com, but if you're interested in Docker, just look it up on docker.com. Um, what we try with new Semtech is really to reuse everything. So um, I've already matched, mentioned mix and matching. So we've built services like the login and the registration, which we can reuse on, on um, different projects, but we have a lot of them. And we can just keep mix, mix and matching. But what we also found is that um, for some projects, this is not enough. So we started building templates. A template is basically a base Docker image, which you can start your service on. And this greatly redu reduces the amount of code you need because the, the template provides um, all these uh, base technologies that we've defined before. So by building your uh, microservice on the template, you already have support for SparkQL, for JSON API. You don't have to think about this yourself. It's already provided. And then there are some services where we noticed uh, some, some 
patterns that we <coughs> use. Well, we're doing this a lot, and we, we're not going to build a service every time we need this. Um, so we created some configurable services. Mucell Resources um, is a service that you can provide a model to, and it provides a CRUD API for the resources that you define in that model. So out of the box, JSON API, really minutes to set up, not more. And then for uh, services where we find it useful, we provided uh, Ember add-ons, which are like plugins for your front end that you can just plug in. It links directly to the service and provides what you need. For example, for login, no need to think about it. Just set up the login service, include the login add-on, and you have login in your application. A similar one is the data table add-on. If you need listing, I'm sure everyone has done some data tables in, um, in their website or in their application. We have an add-on for that. It talks JSON API. So that's also a thing about um, the new Semtex stack. You don't have to use the entire stack. If you stick to these standards, so JSON API, SparkQL, um, you can just pick out stuff and use it. If you're already doing JSON API, feel free to use our data table add-on. It will work provided you follow JSON API. So a quick look at um, how this all combines. Um, it's a lot of code, I'm sorry. I know most of us are business people here, but uh, let's start at the left. We have a base template here. So as I mentioned, um, we have uh, templates. This is the Muir Ruby template, which provides the basics we need. And then, I don't know, six lines of code, not more. Um, just doing query and providing that um, as an API. On the right, we have the front-end application, which will display the value returned by our market service. And then a small bit, that's just uh, the dispatcher. I didn't really go into that, but of course, if you have these microservices, you still need to um, map a request to the specific microservice, and that's what we do in the dispatch. And on the left, you have the Docker Compose file. As I said, it's really, really small. Um, once you have that, you can just run one command, Docker Compose up, and you will have an application running, well, displaying hello results 5841. Admittedly, not the most sexy application, but uh, it works. And um, what we find is that if we, uh, by using this Emory JS frontend, we can build really snappy, good looking apps really quickly. Um, this is an example of a MuCL resources configuration. So, as I mentioned, you just describe your model. Um, the one I took here is from the LB LOD project, which is a Flemish project about publishing um, local legislation. Um, and you'll notice here that um, we have the prefixes of our model, um, so, and we have, we have an agenda print, which has the type of slab agenda print, and it has some properties <coughs> and some relationships, and um, it has a resource base, and we provide it on a specific part. And that's really all there is to it. Once you have this, you have a bunch of API calls that you can make, and your front-end developers don't even know, need to know about linked data. All they get is these specific properties, and they can do, um, they can create new resources, they can request them, <coughs> but they can also filter them. They can um, include relationships if they want. It's all provided by MuCell resources. So then the Ember add-ons um, in a bit more detail. Once we've defined this resource, you can just install the Ember paper data table into your application. Um, and this bit of code is all you need to display the list of, of agenda printer that we had earlier. So, um, well, the example here is about books, but same principle applies. Um, just a bit of code, we include the component, which is similar to a web component. If they ever standardize it, we will move to web components. But for now, we're using uh, Ember, Ember components and a mixing in route. That's all you need. So, now that we've built the <coughs> framework and we've been using it for, I think, about two years now, is that correct? Three? Three? Yeah, okay, yeah. even longer than I thought. Um, what we noticed is it's extremely productive. Um, the services that we've built well, it's not all of them, but the services we've built well are completely reused. We've never had this level of uh, reuse before. Um, it's very easy for juniors because the linked data space, as you may know, is, is a bit hard to get into. And 
by providing this framework, we're abstracting that a bit for them. Um, I think Hans mentioned in his, in his talk that um, this freedom of linked data can also be constraining because people have too many possibilities. And uh, I think our framework solves that in, in a bit uh, <coughs> by providing APIs that they can use. So um, we've had juniors build something extra in a day um, because they can just focus on their microservice and that their part of the world that they need to understand. Um, the same for, for front-end developers. They don't really need to understand linked data at all. Of course, it helps if they do. But if they don't, they can just talk to APIs, and that's it. Um, customers really like the front-end. Um, because uh, we're using uh, Ember.js, we can build really snappy uh, JavaScript applications, which are interactive, which, which uh, work well. We work with good designers. That also helps. Um, and what we found, and that I think this is the most surprising bit, is that the data performance is actually quite okay. Uh, we can handle up to 100 concurrent users without issue, and we can scale up to more when we start doing caching. Um, and this caching is also something that's actually fairly easy to include in our application stack. The last thing, and I personally like that one the most about uh, MuSemtech is that um, it makes you very conscious about playing with alternative solutions because you can just mix and match. You can just pick out things you need and if you think, well, perhaps this can be done, done better in another language or even another paradigm, we can just do that. We can focus on that one bit we need and play around with it. If it doesn't work, well, we just throw it away and put the old thing back or even write something new entirely. Um, this is a lot harder when you're focusing on um, monolithic builds. So I really think we solved the microservice space by relying on uh, semantic backlinks. For us, it's been tremendous, and I hope it will also be tremendous for you. Now, Art is going to make you warm about the future of this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, we're, we're kind of reluctant to embrace new things in the stack because we're always afraid that we'll break what we have so far. Um, but if you can find out these orthogonal patterns, which are, if you have a space, like mathematical space, and you have two orthogonal directions, dimensions, then they never impact each other. So what you want to have is you want to create features in the base framework, which you can basically pick and choose, and they don't destroy the other features. Um, I'll kind of explain it. Um, if you have reactive programming, for instance, which is a, a very nice pattern, the idea is that uh, as we write something to the database, a certain state arrives. Based on a certain state, you might want to trigger a specific service that tackles some specific problem. For instance, um, thinking about it mentally, if you write an email to the outbox, it's fairly obvious to assume that some service should pick it up and mail it. Um, and that's exactly what you can do with that. You can send an email or a tweet by writing it to the triple store. Um, the nice thing about that is that it's very similar to send out an email than to send out a tweet. So if your developers basically understand the email case, which again is just writing data to a triple store, it's trivial, um, they can also easily send out emails, send out tweets, which makes the whole thing easier. It also helps with long processing uh, things, like for instance you add a data set and you need a certain set of uh, KPIs, key performance indicators to be calculated. If that KPI thing takes uh, about 10 minutes, then it's very boring to wait for that and definitely shouldn't be triggered from the front end. Um, this reactive programming is especially interesting in combination with, uh, with other things. We're working also on performance, so we know that the database is now okay, but we also know that it's the most tricky thing, that's this one single point of failure, if it fails, it's hard to go away. Um, so what we do is we monitor the changes, that's also necessary for the reactive programming bit. And if you monitor the changes, you can also theoretically, but we haven't done it, um, write to multiple triple stores, so you can have a failover more easily than what you have now with commercial solutions. Furthermore, because we have this, we can do caching on specific resources. And caching on a specific resource, that means that um, you basically enable a cache, and that cache doesn't ever go back to the triple store if a certain request is being made. This sort of performance really helps us mitigate this potential issue of a triple store. Lastly, um, Musemtex says that if we hold all data in this triple store, and we hold it in the semantic model, and that is consistent, then basically all your microservices are very freely combinable. What it doesn't say, though, is that there's a requirement that you mirror that data in a structure that you need. 
So if you have a service that basically needs a completely different access pattern than what a triple store can offer you, you're okay to mirror that. And because you can monitor the changes, you can actually mirror that. Um, if you have all of this cast, then obviously the thing becomes faster, but you still have that issue that was mentioned earlier. What if we have slow clients? We are still loading a single page app, and Ember.js isn't known to be the smallest of them. It's not a huge framework in terms of how much functionality it offers, but it does offer all that functionality. Um, there's also something in there which you can enable, and that is Fastboot. It does require some fiddling. But Fastboot essentially calculates your page on the server side and gives you a view of that page to the client. Now, of course, now you're just hosting a JavaScript rendered page, which you could have just rendered on the server side and not mocked with all of these front-end frameworks. So what it does then is it sends back all of the code that is necessary to generate that page, and it rehydrates the page. So essentially, it throws a static page. You wait three, four seconds, depending on your device. If it's a really slow device, it'll take longer. If it's a fast one, it'll take shorter. And then once that whole page has been loaded up and JavaScript is parsed, the whole page becomes interactive. That gives us a very fast first page render, and it also really helps for pages where we have a lot of read-only pages, because most of them can just be cached. Um, we're working on authority, and this might be one of the more impressive things of what you can do with linked data, I think. Um, all of our services write to one graph in one triple store. We, we basically require you to write, to write Sparkle, and we guarantee you that we give you back the responses. Now, what if a service could wrap around that Sparkle endpoint, and it could figure out what your current user can actually access? So one of the things that you have with a microservice otherwise, imagine you don't have this, that is that if two microservices are basically waiting for a certain authorization pattern, <coughs> something that certain users can see, you will not be able to move them across projects unless they use the same pattern. But if you do it this way, if you solve your authorization in the triple store itself, what you actually get is that all of your microservices that you've written before are now scoped to your specific user. And it has an extra benefit. Currently, in our code, we always add this things that we state, this is what you need in order to know what the current user can access and all of those authorization rules are written in your specific services. So basically you know there's going to be an error here or there, but you don't necessarily know where. If we do this in a specifically configured microservice, in a, in a service that is meant to do authorization, then you know that you'll configure it right. And you basically know that you have cooler patterns that you can work with afterwards because you know that security is going to be done right. Um, the last one, and it, this one works really well with the other case, with the previous one, that is interactivity. If we have all these building blocks, right, and we have caching already enabled, so if you have caching and you have the invalidation of a cache, you know when resources have been updated. It's not really complex to do. If our front-end also understands, and the, the basic knowledge in our front-end are basically ready for that already, if our front-end understands how to update data on screen when the basic model changes, then just by sending push updates, and there's loads of standards for that and, and APIs for that, um, we can proactively push content to a client. Now, if you combine the proactive pushing, which allows you to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, update the prices of your web shop live um, for some market, um, if you combine that with the, uh, with the interactivity, with the authority, you can have applications in which users can cooperate. Now, this is free in terms of developer time. For developers, this doesn't cause you extra time. Of course, it causes you, it's, it's a strain on, on a server. No matter how you change it, you will have more content that you'll be keeping in sync and you will have more complex queries. But the fact that we can experiment with these applications, that we can play with them today rather than having to spend yet another tender for yet another idea, um, that allows us to experiment with new applications, with new types of applications. And that's essentially what we're working on in the future with New Center. Um, our basic ideas, they're consistent, they're good. We know that they're stable. Um, for these new things, we're experimenting, we're figuring out what they do. We have running experiments with most of them, um, but we're not necessarily certain if we'll keep them. If it turns out that it's harder to work with as developers, then it'll probably be removed. Um, we have a bunch of links for all sorts of images that we use. Um, apparently, you have to do that if you do good re research, so they're there. Um, any questions? Probably in the lunch break. Well, I mean, we have time for one or two questions if you, if you can contain yourselves. But if you're not on your computer, I suggest that you just <laughs> position yourself at a table and come to you. Any question? I think everybody's yeah. I think everybody's on your computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>